What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up the Ship Podcast. This is episode 83. Uh, and this is, even though there's been a large gap in content due to my taking a break for holiday family things and whatever, um, it's a sequel to the last episode. So I do another episode with the same EMN2 that I talked to on episode 82. Um, we had some some other stuff that we wanted to get to, especially like the, his experiences with leadership and chiefs and stuff like that, um, that we got to. And it was a really, it's a fun conversation and it was really great to get his perspective, um, not just as a nuke, but as a junior sailor on submarines, like his experience with leadership and getting the perspective from someone that is still junior in their naval career, uh, is something I've been trying to capture for a really long time. And I was really glad we got to do it. So, uh, I hope you all enjoy this. Check it out. Um, all right. But yeah, man, like, well, hopefully this delay thing doesn't kill us. So yeah. I guess for, since I didn't really give you a heads up about what I wanted to talk about, I'm, I'm still a little worried about the same thing happening as the last episode, which, I mean, you said you got good feedback and I did too, but I don't want to come across as like a, you know, just another second class complaining about life. But most of the points yeah. I have, if not all of yeah. them are bad experiences with mostly chiefs quarters and you know a couple engines i've had but then i do have some like positive points to make also just to kind of like counteract that right i think like i think it'll be good because like a, a lot of the lessons unfortunately the best lessons that we pull um, from leadership experiences is the negative stuff like i can tell you a lot of the ways that i've done my job over my career have been like the the burned in scars of like i'm never gonna do that when you know when i'm in my chiefs tour or whatever so yeah um, i think there's there's always a lot of value to pull from it and also i don't think we learn any lessons by not examining the failures and to get it from a, a perspective like yours is going to be really valuable for a lot of people because it's when it, when you're in the position you're in and you still have that perspective, that's the, for me, that's the best time to talk about it. And I've been trying to wrangle somebody like you for a long time to talk about these things in particular for that reason is like, I want to hear it from your perspective while you're still in it. Because while I've effectively been where you are or, you know, pretty, pretty close, right? Obviously we do different jobs, but, um, it's it was so long ago and even for like the chiefs we just pinned it was so long ago since they were in that position that you lose some of that like you lose some of the how it makes you feel in that moment you lose some of the like just the details of the experience and so like maybe you look back at it and some of the bad stuff falls away you know what i mean it's like the yeah. joke about how we get people to re-enlist is like you forget all the bad things and you only remember <laughs> the good so I'm pumped. I'm pumped to hear all of your stories and, and for us to kind of break them down and talk about them because I think this is the time to do it where the stuff is still fresh. You're still in that position where you know what it's like to be a second class on a submarine still like vividly. And so, um, yeah, man, I think I don't I don't think I think we'll productively guide the conversation in a way that won't make it reflect on you in that way. I think that we're we're purposely picking the negative experiences. And like you said, you'll share some positive ones as well. And I'm sure I will, but the negative stuff is is where we're gonna get the most, you know, goodness from. It's where the lessons are going to come from. So Yeah. We'll I'm not happy. as worried about it either because when I was on my first boat, I was just the typical super angry nuke, like just snapping on people all day, every day and like <laughs> going home and being all upset like you know you get home you make a a uh, decently stiff drink and play your video games like yep but so once <laughs> i left that first boat i just kind of like i mean especially with i met my wife like halfway through being on that boat and so okay. once i left there she kind of pushed me to like you need to chill out before you go to this next place like just kind of reset yourself and, yeah and that's when i kind of realized like Good, yeah, maybe i am too angry <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's good. That's what it took for me was I, I've I've gone out of my way to talk openly about like me going to mental health and stuff because it took my wife to kind of punch me in the side of the head and just yeah. be like, no, really, you have a problem. You need to go yeah. talk to somebody about this because I she was dealing with a lot of the negative uh, effects of it. So that's awesome. But um, I mean, yeah, I guess we can just kind of like jump straight yeah, into man, it from there then. In. So yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, I do want to start off with one point that we didn't get to in the last episode, the the detailing process of 
how okay. I got to, you know, my, my second kind of submarine quote unquote. I don't really want to get into like specifics okay. cause I don't want to talk too much about like, you know, specific commands that these stories are happening at. But, uh, right. So like I said, the last episode, I needed to stay in Virginia for like family issues and, uh, mm. just staying in the Norfolk area was best for me. So it took me, I think about four months to finally get a hold of the EDIV detailer, which was wow. calling him multiple times a week. And then if I was underway, my wife would try to call him once or twice a week, leaving voicemails, emailing him. Uh, I even got my EDMC mm-hmm. on my first boat to email him at one point just to see if, you know, wow. throwing a anchor with a star on it was going to help at all, but didn't really get anywhere. Yeah. But uh, so that's, super disheartening and then once i finally got a hold of him yeah uh was by calling the mdiv detailer and you know i, I just called the EDIV detailer and rang all the way through to voicemail so then it called mdiv and he said mm-hmm. the EDIV detailer was just sitting right across from him just hanging out at his desk <laughs> so i asked him if he was busy or if he just got back from something because i just tried calling him he was like no he's been here all morning he's he's not really busy right now he's actually <laughs> looking at me and I'm looking at him. All right, well, can I talk uh, to him? And he was like, yeah, I'll transfer you. So I finally got a hold of him on, I think it was about two or three days out from the end of my last window. And so the dude picked up the phone once I got transferred and sounded pretty upset about having to be on the phone with me from the get go. Probably because I've been annoying with job. voicemails. Yeah. But I, Unreal. I, uh, explained my whole situation to him and, while I was on the phone with him, I was on my Navy assignment and he was Mm -hmm. basically telling me like there weren't any billets available in Norfolk. And I told him I was on my Navy assignment and I was looking at a couple and he, you know, was of course surprised by that quote unquote, but, um, (laughs) ended up telling me like, you know, you can go here to stay in Virginia or like we can send you to prototype in South Carolina to be close. And I said that wasn't going to work. And then ended up just applying for orders on my own and seeing how it worked out and those orders got accepted, I guess is the right word. And I started getting them processed and the orders were getting written and I went to check one day and Mm -hmm. he had, uh, canceled the orders and advised me to a different set of orders in the Norfolk area that I specifically said I didn't want to get, but I mean, I get like stuff happens, but then when I called him and asked him about it, he said he didn't do that. And then, you know, on a, my Navy assignment, it shows his name next to advise to these yeah. orders. And I was like, you didn't advise me and your name's right here. So how are you going to say it's not your fault? Yeah. But that whole process puts a pretty bad taste in your mouth for showing up to a new command. Right. And it's just something that you hear from people. I mean, I'm sure it's every <sighs> rate across the Navy, but especially nukes. Like you end yeah. up at a, you know, what people think is like a bad command and you ask people like, Oh, why'd you want to come here? And they're like, I didn't. Like, oh, me neither. Cool. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Well, and that like that gets a lot. You lose a lot organizationally. Like leadership's gonna have a way more difficult time. And you just lose a lot that is unless it's a really good command, it's largely irreparable to there were people like that when I, I was at the A school where it was just like they were from because our a school is um in fort lee right so it's like about two hours from norfolk Uh, and so a lot of people from the tidewater area wanted a shore duty that was local and they couldn't get one so they said well okay i guess i'll go there but then they kept like their house in in hampton roads or whatever and drove two hours every day to get to work and back um, so it was like four hours of driving every single day yeah. and they were mad about it and it's like, okay, I get it. But like you, sh- you, there's this part where it's like you chose to not live locally. So I can't like, the, how do you want me to fix that for you? Like you decided to drive up here every day, but now you're complaining about having to drive up here every day. And it's like, I understand that these aren't the orders you wanted, but there's also that other mechanism of like, you know, the Navy gets what the Navy wants. Like it, you, you signed up for this, all that other crap that you, t- that you say to people. Right. But yeah. um, what I don't understand is why the Navy doesn't program that kind of, like, I understand 
sometimes like it, it not in your case but sometimes when you get on there there's only orders to a certain place right like there's only we only need this this nec and this rate at this pay grade in guam or whatever um and nowadays my understanding of it and i am not a manning expert is that there's like placement and then there's the detailers and placement is the one that like decides what jobs populate at what time. And then the detailer just puts, you know, square peg and square pole, square hole, (laughs) round peg and round hole, (laughs) at least theoretically. So like, yeah, I just, you'd think that, and, and it seems like there's some kind of effort to make it better, but it seems like it's more focused on making the organization more efficient than it is about again like most things we do in the navy taking care of the people right and it's like why are we not trying to put the right people in that job because i want at that a school i wanted people that wanted to be there because it's like i it's it's hard to to program that into them like i it's really really difficult even if i get them to come around like as much as I can, their ceiling's going to be lower because they don't want to be there. Like no matter what I do to make the job amazing, it's like uh, they still don't want to drive two hours every day. And I can't fix that for them because they own a home and there's all these other demands. And like you said, you had some kind of family thing that yeah. you that you wanted to stay in that area, got to stay in that area, but then did a job you didn't want to do. So it's like you're not going to be happy at work every day because you don't want to do this job. And you made that pretty clear. And then you know devil's advocate is there's jobs that no one wants to do but um and so there's going to be a certain level of that at some point that's like needs of the navy but i feel like that gets used as an excuse far too often and then i wish i understood more and i was gonna i scrolled through really quick while you were talking about i episode 66 it's called so you want to go to norfolk ironically um, talks a lot about detailing stuff that my buddy Tony, he was like a ECM slash detailer a couple different times, um, understands it a lot more than I do. I, I'd like to get somebody else on to kind of dive deeper into that just to get a better understanding of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wish I had more insight on it, but it, big picture, it seems like it, I, like we could just do such a better job of of putting people where they want to be while simultaneously like meeting the needs of the Navy at least in a broader swath so that it's like people are happier. I get the the needs of the Navy side. I know, especially for nukes, it's hard to stay yeah. in Norfolk for shore duties and stuff like that. But at the same time, yeah. like I had orders to uh, basically, you know, something like NRMD, like a uh, uh, availability support yeah. kind of thing. And the orders mm-hmm. were processing and then got advised and all that. But then even when I showed up to that second command, because I was very upset about the whole thing and how it had gone when I was doing all my check-ins, talking to, you know, the Cobb and EDMC, and I even kind of made like a side-handed like comment to it to the captain when I was doing the check-in with him. Like, I didn't want to be here. I specifically asked not to. I have very legitimate reasons to have the other orders I was supposed to get. And all of them, like all the way mm-hmm. up, told me, you know, we on purpose had a couple people rerouted because that maintenance activity is overmanned. So you're just here to support maintenance. And then when this uh, boat is done doing its thing, you'll be sent back to that maintenance activity. And so at first I was like, okay, well that, that actually doesn't sound too bad. Cause I, I like doing maintenance, like, you know, electricians, you get to okay. mess around in panels and stuff. And I, I get some kind of satisfaction out of that, but then right after I got right. told all you're going to do is maintenance, I get handed my usual nuke stack of qual cards. I'm like, oh, you got to qualify, <laughs> like, you know, steaming at sea watches. It's like, this is the exact opposite of what I was just told, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. Yeah, I man, I like, detailing is like this weird, like, I don't, gremlin in the room that just... I really wish there was a lot more transparency and a lot more because it's one of those things where it's like, why do I not understand? I'm a master chief. I've been doing this for 20 years. Why do I not understand in great detail what actually happens? And and one could say, well, it's because you're not paying attention and here's a PowerPoint for you to study. And it's like, that's not what I mean. I don't mean like I could read the My Navy Assignment User Guide. Great. Thanks. But like I'm talking about like what's happening in Millington. Like, why do I not have a deep understanding 
of what's actually going on there. And and could I go figure it out by using my network? Yeah, probably. But like, why is it not super transparent? Like, why don't you have access to the things that would give you that kind of transparency so that you understand exactly what you need to do to get to where you want to be? And it's like, at the very least, it's kind of like advancement where it's like, if you put enough stuff out there, it's like, do you know exactly what happens at the Chiefs board? No, but I can tell you enough. And I have through podcasts and everything else. And so has like they put out through precepts and board convening letters and like PowerPoints from the the board and everything else where and the advancement manual, like, you know, pretty much exactly what happens there. And I know I was a board member. So like, I know I know exactly what happens there. But like the training material that's accessible by everyone it, it paints a pretty it's like a 90 percent product like you it, and there's some stuff that's kept confidential because to discuss it would like it'd get a little weird for the people that aren't selected and the people you know what i mean but yeah and it's not perfect i can tell you that for sure like in that in the episode that i did of how to make chief it's like it's not perfect i'm not i think they could do far better but it's not corrupt and like you know what i mean like it's just not designed as efficiently as it could be to select the best possible people but like in this case with detailing i just i don't understand why all that stuff is not super accessible and transparent and why the process isn't set up in a way where it's like it should be super obvious why you got detailed where you did and you should have some control at which i know they kind of like oh you get to fill out the thing that says this is where i want to go and like but then you hear all these experiences where it seems like they effectively disregarded that and didn't care where you wanted to go they just put you wherever it was convenient for their little spreadsheet to turn green or whatever they're using to track like billets that are empty and people that they have rolling and it's like i don't know it's another it's another function of like leadership failing to understand the impact that their decisions have on people like in real life and it yeah yeah it's confusing doesn't it blows my mind that they they lose so much trust of the people that like they need to follow them in order to do the job because then these same people that are in those positions roll back to boats and everybody knows who they are and i'm like i can't imagine the pain that they go through i would think i don't know I'd have to talk to one of them, but yeah, especially with the the Edith yeah. detailer at the time. Uh, a lot of guys I'm working with right now also dealt with him to get to the current command of mm-hmm. Matt because they transferred around the yeah. same time. But you'd ask anybody, you know, you you name drop the guy, and everyone always has the same like, yeah, oh, that guy. Like, <laughs> everybody knows yeah. him. But I, I had one of those. Yeah. I had one of those as well that I had a really hard time with. But so conversely, though, my experience, I was a senior chief and it was I leveraged some relationships I had, which not everybody has access to. But hear me out. So um, I had access to like my force level people that do my job that can exert a lot of pressure on a detailer. And it wasn't like I was like hooking myself up, there were boats available in the area that I was trying to go to. And he was just telling me there wasn't. And so then I called the guy in the area that runs all the boats and was like, Hey man, do you have any chief billets? Cause this dude's telling me that there aren't any jobs on your waterfront. And he immediately lost his mind. It was like, are you kidding me? Like I have so many chief billets that are empty. Like I need so many people, blah, blah, freaked out. He's like, let me call you back and like hangs up and it, it developed from there. But I can tell you like, so I'm doing that job right now. Uh, and I tell people all the time, like, call me if, if you're not getting what you need from anyone, but it's like, especially someone like the detailer, call me and I'll pick up the phone and the detailer's not going to not take my call. You know what I mean? Like, and it's a very different yeah. conversation when master chief's calling you and I'm the guy that like selects them to their next promotion, at least in their mind but like that possibility exists and we all talk. There's not many of us in the submarine force. So it's one of those kinds of things where, um, and I even tell people like, I got a lot of buddies that are EDMCs that I'm really close with. So it's like a guy like you call me and I'll get, I'll get guys to exert pressure on. And it's not like for, I'm not going to get somebody to like break the rules for you to hook you up with some job you just want, 
But if you're having a hard time getting them to even answer the phone, which is like their own, their primary duty, and a lot of them it, nowadays, and I'm sure your detailing process might have might have been before this, but like with the COVID stuff, like I know detailers that haven't been in that building in like a, o- over a year because they've been working from home. So like you don't have the bandwidth really to answer your phone and check your email. Yeah, so that's, that's um, what blew my mind in, was months of calling and leaving voicemails yeah. and I was emailing while I was underway and my wife was calling while I was underway and just nothing like yep. I had to call the dude right. sitting at the and, desk and, next to him to get an answer. Yeah. And the reason I bring up the call guy like me thing, if you have access to that person, like and even if you don't like chances are that person is going to be like, what? And then maybe they have multiple data points because like I had a kid get a hold of me. He was one of my old LPOs. That said, hey, do you, like, is a detailer like not in the office or something? Like, what's going on? And I'm like, I should be, as far as I know. Like, what's going on? He's like, I emailed, called, same same kind of description you've given, and not answering. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, give me about five minutes. I bet you're gonna get a phone call. You know what I mean? And so, like, sent an email. I just sent an email, and he was, you know, like to his credit or like benefit of the doubt or whatever, he was in the middle of the chief season. So you know how that goes. Like sometimes those guys get overloaded and freak out. And even though they're specifically briefed that your primary duty is the main focus, chief season is like additional training. They lose their mind and neglect their primary duty sometimes. Um, so yeah. I sent an email just saying, Hey, you know, I understand what you're going through. However, your primary duty comes first, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't want to, I keep getting phone calls that you're not picking up the phone and that you're not answering your emails. Five minutes later, the kid gets a phone call. So it's like, it's one of those. And and I had, I was talking to his CMC. I was, I was getting ready to call the, like the Millington CMC and I have access to those people. So like stuff will go from snail's pace to, to light speed when you get someone involved like that. So if you have, if you know that person, or even if you don't, and you just know that like, Hey, your squadron EDMC has got a great reputation. Talk to your EDMC. If your EDMC can't get the ball rolling, which I mean, your EDMC would generally be enough. But yeah, when, when you start getting calls from squadron EDMCs and like group people, and you're going to see an attitude shift real quick, generally. Um, so it's it's a mechanism which it shouldn't have to be that way, but it it's how yeah, it you definitely shouldn't how you navigate be, the bro- but, the broken system. Yeah, for sure. Just one of the sad parts of the job is that sometimes you just got to be <sighs> you know just a dick to people to get them to actually do their job. Like, yeah, and it's I didn't even have to be a dick. It was like. I sent like a five sentence email that was just like, and I did it on purpose because I thought about that. I was like, am I dropping the hammer on this guy? And I was like, yeah, I started thinking about like, all right, what's going on right now? Like, okay, he's a chief select. So, and he's, I know him well enough to know that the most likely scenario was that he was overwhelmed and he freaked out and completely dropped his primary duty. Cause I've seen that happen a hundred times, probably more like just chief selects that, even though they were specifically briefed and we really drive that point home. We don't want them abandoning their work center to do chief select things, but you see it happen a lot because they're, they're more afraid of the negative reaction if they don't get this task done than they are of what would happen if they don't get their work list done because they manage their work list. And there's, you know, a lot of times that kind of stuff can get that can might be able to get kicked down the road and that's the that's the math they do in their head well i can i can do that later it's okay like or or my second class can do the plan of the day and then the plan of the day gets screwed up and then it gets routed to the xo and then the xo is yelling at me because of plan. you know what i mean and then i've because yeah. i've removed myself from that process so it's it's one of those things where i was like all right let me just send a hey i know where you're at i understand you're stressed out but I need you to refocus and because I'm getting calls that you're not answering emails and phone calls and your primary duty comes first. If you need anything from me, call me. I'm happy to help. That kind of thing. It was really like, hey, man, like you need to do this. Like just kind of of course correction. It's probably the best way of saying it. It wasn't I didn't even go in on him, you know, and I, I think you're going to get a better result that way anyway is like. Oh God, because he doesn't want me to be disappointed either. You know what I mean? So he's like, oh geez, mad like the CS Master Chief is is mad at me. Cause like 
you got to think like he's dealing with his chiefs mess about all these taskers and there's, you know, one, maybe two master chiefs that aren't in rate. And then you got somebody that's in rate telling you uh, like, Hey, you need to do your job too. It's like, it's, you get a pretty quick course correction. So it's like, I don't think mm-hmm. you need to be a dick about it. And in this was a unique case, right? There are, it sounds like yours was more m- malicious where it was like the guy was just being lazy for maybe he was about to retire. Maybe he was just a lazy guy and didn't care. He was bitter and angry about something else that was going on. Who knows? But yeah, it's, it's, and, and in that case, if I could objectively show that he was just being that guy, which it sounds like w- in your case, it'd be it'd be pretty simple to call that m diff detailer and be like hey is this normal okay thanks i'm calling your cmc now <laughs> and just like drop an anvil on that guy's head but um but yeah it's gross that it, you pretty commonly hear like stories like this you know what i mean like uh, across all rates it's like it just seems like detailers and i've had a good one too so it's like you know anecdotal evidence i guess but um, yeah I mean, yeah, it seems like it's, it's just something that puts a bad taste in your mouth. Like I said, for showing up to that new command, even though that command right, right. usually has nothing to do with it, except for the one I showed up to said, you know, they made calls and had people rerouted, but, and I mean, even that yeah. gets into like the first, the first 72 hours or whatever it is. When you're talking about yeah. junior sailor showing up somewhere, like <laughs> you can't have a new guy show up yeah. and play like the, the cool stepdad act. Where you're like, oh, hey, man, I get it. Like, you know, life's hard, but yeah. it's because of this reason. And then the way it ended up at that command was the um, the guy that actually told me, you know, you're only here to do maintenance and stuff. Like, you're not going to have to worry about anything else. Right before he handed me a stack of qual cards, ended up not being that great of a person in general, like as a human <laughs> being or the rank he was at. But yeah. so that kind of destroys trust on his end. Because you show up and, like I said, you're being yeah. all buddy buddy, and then literally a week later, yep. basically, he's putting an unexpected workload on me. Like, oh no, this is actually why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Contrary to what I told you before, yeah. It, and that's like I, I don't, I. It's it gets annoying, I'm sure, for listeners to hear me just say like. And that's why leadership development and education kids, you know, like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it really does all kind of come back around to that where it's just like these people think that the best way of doing things is that, or they wouldn't be doing them. And I, I really believe the majority of the time that the people in those positions aren't showing up to work, trying to suck, right? They're not trying to do things to make your life harder but they think based on like their own experience, what they were taught, what they saw happen, their validated behavior over a period of time with promotions and awards, all those things. Like it all adds up to behavior, right? They're behaving the way the organization shows them how to. Sometimes the way the organization incentivizes to like um, Paul Kingsbury, the fleet master chief I talked to all the time. He says that like he would point at precepts and convening letters, which like I was mentioning earlier, like kind of like lay out the priorities for advancement that th- those things drive behavior because when people read them and it says, Hey, community involvement, volunteer work, college collaterals, all that crap that we get so frustrated with. It's like, but it's in, it's in that document. If you took it out and said, no, this in fact, isn't a criteria for advancement, people would stop doing it or at least stop prioritizing in the way that they do. And eventually the, the sale of the year boards and the, the ranking boards and everything else would follow suit. But those things drive behavior. So like the, the way the organization prioritizes things, the way the organization um, values things and, and validates things through what the validation processes it has available drives behavior. And so you get these people that like, Hey, we don't prioritize leadership development and education. We don't prioritize soft skills and, and like treating people with dignity and respect, even though we say it a lot, like we don't prioritize really taking care of people. And like, you're starting to see good signs, I guess through like it, it's reactionary and it's like band-aids on bullet holes. So like they're putting out fires you see a prior priority for like some mental health stuff, like with the warrior toughness program, but it's in reaction to this giant spike in suicidal ideations and attempts, you know, and, and like completions. Like you see, um, 
certain things like start to happen, but it's in reaction to allowing it to get to a place where everything's on fire. And I think some of it is like sailors are taking to social media and taking the platforms like this and talking about it out loud. That's driving a lot of that change instead of the organization actually prioritizing it as part of like who we are and what we do. Since you're, you're talking about um, people turning to social media and stuff and yeah, I guess these opinions or stories, interactions, stuff like that are all becoming more public, which mm-hmm. is kind of a double-edged sword. Like it's good and bad, but then yeah. you obviously I'm a nuke. So I'm going to bring up the reactors critical, but you have yeah. pages like the reactors critical who on veterans day recently made a, a post that I really thought was, you know, a solid post, but basically said, mm-hmm. don't burn yourself out for unrealistic expectations. <laughs> that's just one of, I think the biggest flaws in the new community specifically, but I think it's also just a thing of people kind of forget, um, the basic need for rest, I guess would be the easiest way mm-hmm. to put it, which yeah. is why you end up getting a lot of these stories is because leadership is essentially when you get the bad stories, it's because they're leaning more on emotional energy to get themselves through a situation or even just a day because right. they're not, they're not getting the time off. I mean, nobody's getting the time off and I guess part of the job, yeah. but if you don't have enough time to go home and decompress and get the rest that your body physically needs when you show back up to work the next day, or if you're underway, when you go on that next watch, you're kind of relying on that emotional energy to deal with certain yeah. situations. And then you end up with a lot of people just snapping or yeah. you, know, you get knee jerk reaction is a term that's thrown out a lot. Yeah. I, um, so <laughs> I was just talking to my therapist about this. Like, <laughs> I'm a master chief because I was trying to, I was burning myself out for those unrealistic expectations. But, and and I told him, I'm like, if it weren't for cancer, I don't think, I I think I would have done this job till it killed me lit like all the way, whether it was, yeah. I mean, however I ended up there, whether it was like my body doing what it did or it was, I, like look woke up at 32 years 34 years in the navy or whatever and looked around and i had a one bedroom apartment and and no family and like all i had was this career that i was about to leave and nothing and then i you know maybe i kill myself or maybe i just it spirals out of control somehow like i would have run myself into the ground in some i would have found a way you know what i mean and it was like so it's kind of it i've i've spent time in the last year apologizing to a lot of people um also because i don't think they, i mean i i don't think i know they didn't get the best version of me you know what i mean like what especially on my last boat it was i didn't want to be a cook chief anymore i was trying to be a 3mc because i wanted to do something different and that didn't work out because there was no jobs detailing etc like so i had to go back and do the same job i did but um I was not happy about it and then ended up in a, like in a pretty good place. I mean, it was, a, it got me back to the location I needed to be in because of family things. But, um, I didn't deal with it well, man. Like I've talked to, in the past about like staying and dive and the anxiety that that brought and all the other stuff. And I was trying to be a cob still, I was still full speed ahead. So, I mean, I was doing, I was redlining the whole time. And, uh, as a result, my guys didn't get the best version of me, which is kind of gross, you know, like it's your primary duty is taking care of those people. And it's like, I I mean, like overall, I, I took care of them, but I didn't, there were times where it was like, they, they got a really negative representation of me by no fault of their own. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah, the, hour or two i have a day tops to like come down to the mess decks and interact with them they get i'm i'm angry and snappy and like deprived of sleep and stressed out because i have to go do this thing that's giving me all this anxiety and not allowing me to sleep well and turns out i got a cancerous tumor in my face too and it was just not a good thing dude like it was bad and i've spent uh, the last few years like apologizing to those people even the ones like I had a kid made chief make chief this year that he spent a little bit of time as my LPO and um, 
I don't think I think I could have done a way better job. I like I tried, but I think I could have done a way better job with him if I had been doing a better job of balancing and and what's what's gross and a little counterintuitive is I think in order to do that, I would have needed to shut down a lot of the other things I was doing, which are the things that made me a master chief on paper. So it's like, well, okay, so what do we do? What are we doing? Like, what are we validating the behavior that led me to like run it until the wheels fell off the wagon, you know, and negatively impacted my ability to lead or do we want to validate me slowing down? I think people get used to operating at basically max capacity. Just again, that's, I understand this part of the job. I'm going to play devil's advocate and say it's necessary at certain times, but still sure it's not healthy to keep doing that all the time. Like if you're on deployment on mission, yeah, you're not going to get any sleep. You're doing, you know, Mm -hmm. you're doing God's work. You're out there doing what you signed up for quite literally. But if you're in port getting an inspection, like why is everyone hanging out on the boat for God awful amount Mm -hmm. of hours? And then they're like, (laughs) Oh, don't worry. You get to go home for six hours tonight. You get six hours of sleep. Like, no, I don't I have a 30 plus minute drive home. I got to get home. I got to get, you know, everything ready. You got to wake up, shower in the morning, get back yeah. to work, beat yeah. the traffic. Like it's just, it's stuff like yeah. that. That's just like, you know, people just get used to it. And I mean, yeah. like, personally I've gotten used to it, but it doesn't mean I'm happy about it. Yeah. And then you get into <laughs> stuff like one of my worst experiences on my first boat was when I had to stand in port, shut down in shipyard I had to stand almost 16 hours of watch and maneuvering because the way the watch bill was working out, we barely had enough people to support that night's duty section. One guy got pulled off to go support uh, basically a secondary watch. Um, mm. I, people probably know if I say control point watch, they'll know what I'm talking about. But so yeah. that put me as the, the basically the only shutdown electrical operator for most of the day. And our engineer That's, came in maneuvering yeah. because we called him in there to point down the watch bill and explain to him what was going to happen and basically said like can you get the ball rolling on permission to secure the shutdown electrical operator because it's something you can do in port if you meet certain conditions on the plan uh, okay and basically told him like if we don't secure the shutdown electrical operator like i'm gonna end up standing like i said almost 16 hours of watch i'll get a break for yeah you know like go grab some food real quick or whatever but this is the way it's going to work out overnight and then the the engineer, the engineering officer, the guy in charge of the nukes, <laughs> knows all these requirements and everything, just yeah. looked me in the eye and said, oh, that sounds like it's going to suck, and then walked out maneuvering and went home for the night. And so I stood my wow. almost 16 hours at the panel staring at a bunch s- of stuff that doesn't change. Like, Did he sit at home like watching Netflix, just writing the f- like shell of the critique? Because, because like... <laughs> When stuff like that happens, I it's you end up at a critique, right? And it's like because something goes wrong, and you're just like, well, "How did how did we end up here?" And then you hear stories like that that you just and you're I I can't tell you the number of times I've been at one of those, which sounds weird because I'm a cook. Like, how many critiques do you go to? But like <laughs> duty chief and stand standing in for the cob and department chief and stuff like that. So like more than you think, and um, it. It, it's I want to come across the table at some of these people like yeah. how how do you, you do would, that and then go home like you I don't... would think a talk like that happened but it it didn't the only thing that came of it was the duty officer for that night wrote me a little sticky note that said you know Eamon to blah has permission to sleep through Reveille in the morning uh, because he stood <laughs> X amount of hours of watch with like this little bit little, yeah. little amount of break and so I took that sticky note I, and got some uh, uh, EB red and taped it to the side of my rack, like right where my head is. So that way when red yeah. light went off in the morning and I rolled back over, the duty chief wouldn't come light me up about it. But then the, uh, the I, duty chief still lit me yeah. up about being in the rack. Did it anyway. I pointed the note out to him and then he got all all upset and went and talked to the duty officer. But yeah, yeah there was no, no critique or talking about your feelings <sighs> after. It just became like one of those yeah. stories about like oh did you hear when uh when this dude stood that much that yeah. much watch the other night like, yeah oh my god dude <laughs> if i was the duty chief and i found out that was real i would have lost my mind 
Like that would have been like a screaming at the commanding officer moment. Oh, wow. And I wonder if the, did the CO even know? Do you, did like, did you know that if he ever was made aware of that? Uh, I honestly can't say. I like to think he heard about it. Okay. Um, I mean, the captain yeah. we had at the time was actually pretty solid. So right. I like to think in my head that he heard about it days or weeks after and kind of gave that end to talking to, but that end right. ended up getting, uh, you know, we're a lot, we weren't allowed to say at the time, but ended up essentially getting fired because they didn't really trust him to be okay. an end. So he swapped. With the I, that was going to, that was going to be my next question was like, what kind of guy was your eng overall? Was and like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cause that's the other, it's like, what, how does a guy like that end up in that position? Like, and I, I kind of know the answer to my own question, but cause I, I've, I've had a lot of bad engineers. Like it's, and I think it's, you know, I, I don't know what NR puts into that selection process other than like what PNEO scores or like how yeah, they, they passed PNEO and, and they haven't you yeah. know, broken anything on the plant before, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's like, they do really well in PNEO. I would imagine. Cause like, I, I don't know. Some of the, some of the engines I've had can barely string together sentences. And so I'm like, how are, how are you here? Like, how are, yeah. how are you in this position? Um, that's actually the, the yeah. engine that I have right now is kind of like that. Is, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's the engine. You gotta, yeah. you know, respect him through title and stuff. And he's not a bad guy. He means well, but he's got a lot of right. good idea fairies floating around. Well, I can man if, if if he's a good dude that means well, I can manage that. But like when yeah. it's a guy that is willing to stare you in the face and say, "Well, that sounds like it's gonna suck," and then go home, like that guy. Oh yeah, that was a I'm whole different animal to deal with. Destroy, for especially sure. being yeah, I, I had been on board for six months at that point. I think like I was only qualified shutdown electrical operator. So like, what am I gonna mm, say to the guy? But right, good lord. That's, but that's why you can't retain nukes either. So it's like the type of people that do those things being in those positions. And I've seen a lot of them. Um, conversely, I've had a lot of really amazing EDMCs. So maybe it, that's how it balances out. But, um, cause like I, I'd say almost every EDMC I've ever had has meat puppeted the engineer. So it's like who really want, runs engine up, you know what I mean? But, yeah. um, I, I don't know. Like I, I look at it like those types of experiences are a large reason why you don't get nukes to stay in or that when they are in, they have such negative experiences that it bleeds over into everything. And that's why <laughs> the perception exists that uh, I just saw this like Bart Simpson meme that I think trick shared. That was hilarious about like how nukes are natural enemies with pretty much everything. And it just, it was the janitor guy going on. and on. <laughs> it was really funny. And it was just like, it's, it's, it's funny when you share the meme, but it's like, when you examine why that is, is real, like why that stereotype exists, it's like, it's depressing, man. Cause like, I don't, I don't know how you, how you like make that better. Even if I had gotten to go back as a cob, like, I don't know how you make that better for them because of all the, like NR is the, is really the mechanism for like fixing a lot of that stuff i mean there might be a way where if you got like the world's best triad or like it became direction from like squadron group whatever all the way up to like sub pack sub land where to like do certain things in a way where it like relieves some of the pain and somehow manages all of like the epm whatever requirements or edm or whatever the hell um book tells you to do all this painful stuff like it's I don't know that there's a way to do it where it's not excruciating. You know what I mean? And it's like, so it seems like it, NR is the one that needs to, to examine this, but I, it doesn't seem like there's an appetite to do that. And then also like, I'm real curious. I'd have to probably ask someone else, but I've had a lot of nukes tell me that like my, one of my best friends was a nuke mechanic that has worked in the civilian industry, same lane for a really long time. Um, and he said a lot of the, like power plants and stuff that he's worked for purposely go after Navy nukes, like recruiting wise, because the standards and like, uh, 
like quality of training and length of training and everything are so yeah. much higher. No, I've heard the same that, thing. Yeah. That Cause they, they basically think that like, we're like robots. Like you hand them a procedure yeah. and they're going to be like, this is what I have to do. Okay. And like, no questions, yep. unless it's like obviously wrong or, you know, you're going to break something, but they're not going to try to f- try to find shortcuts just to, you know, do something quicker. Right. Which people but you still also, do that, but you know, <laughs> The level of education, like you guys are the experience you have, like the the like the level of experience and the depth and breadth of experience. And then also just the training, like you guys spent so long in your training pipeline that it's like by the time they get you at such a young age, it's like you're you're way more experienced and have a higher level of knowledge than people they would hire off the streets from like, I don't know. I don't know if they hire people off the streets or if you have to like go to school for it as a civilian, but. Yeah, they they know what they're getting and it's like, oh, that's what that's what I want. Like you guys are so much better. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I wonder if it's if it's almost like the bar is too high, which I hate saying out loud, but it's like you, it makes you wonder, like, are we doing too much? And it's like the easy example to point out is like, and I think we talked about it last time a little bit was like the training, like how it's like <laughs> death by PowerPoint and you just each quarter you repeat the same thing and see the same PowerPoint and drone on about the same thing. And it's like, how much value are you even getting from this? And like you said, you could like go back in your notebook and look at the same notes from the training before yep. and have all the answers that you need kind of thing. So it's, I don't know. Yeah, man. it was actually, like, but, I was thinking about that point after we did the last episode about the death by PowerPoint and everything. And I was trying yeah. to think if there's been any, legitimately good PowerPoint trainings I've had. And the only one I could think of was uh, my first boat did school of the boat. I'm not sure if that's like a yeah. normal thing, but basically yeah, get unqualified people to go learn about ship systems, get their fish. And right. we had an A ganger doing a presentation on, I think it was like hydraulics or something, but one yeah. of the A gang systems and he had like a five slide PowerPoint. And so he's clicking through and he's basically like, this is where the pumps are. This is the power supply. This is the loads it does. And then it got to the end and it was not even five or 10 minutes into the training. And so, you know, all the unqualified dudes are sitting on cruise mess and we're like, Oh, this is already over. Like, sweet. I can go back to, you know, doing whatever. And then he said, yeah. we're going to take a field trip. And he spent the next like 45 it. minutes walking us down to the machinery room, showing us, you know, where all this stuff is. And like to the boat, yeah, uh locations where the loads are at and mm. we were underway at the time so there's like stuff he can't show us because we're not you know tied to the pier or whatever but basically yeah. explaining like you know when we pull in keep an eye out for this or like ask uh somebody that's qualified you know dive or uh for 9g it's like the pilot co-pilot but mm. basically like asking one of the guys that's qualified to drive the boat about how this specific thing works and then you know, just get an idea of how it works. And at the end of it, um, he basically said like, I'm not going to sign the checkout, even though that was a checkout. Like this is basically homework for you to do. And that was yeah. hands down the most productive training I got. Yep. Because even though you have <laughs> most of the answers, now you're kind of like, Oh, I do want to go see that. Like, yeah. Yeah. And you're going to remember like it, at a board, they're going to say, you know, like where's the ship service hydraulic plant? Uh, like, what does it power? And you're going to remember in your head when MMA two walked you down there and showed you where the stuff was. So you're going to oh, immediately yeah. know, Oh yeah, it's here. And yeah, like, I, yeah, I remember dude, like, I, I thought you were now the field trip and everything. Yeah. Like everybody that was there with me, like standing, you know, yep. in the machine room, in the engine room, looking at the equipment. And that was, I don't even know how many, like years ago when I got my fish. Like, yeah. I mean, not that long, yeah. you know, especially for you comparatively, right. but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a long time ago and land far, far away. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, one of the coolest ones I like, I've seen things that like PowerPoint can do some cool things like, but by and large, I think it's, it's stupid and we probably shouldn't use it much, but like the, I had a, on my last boat, we used it as like a simulation for um, hydraulic ruptures. So like they would put a screen up in control where it would simulate the all the plant indications for a hydraulic rupture and it was just PowerPoint slides and it it had like an illustration of um like the I don't god I don't remember now like the pumps that are running and not and then like the um accumulator 
uh, levels or whatever and all that crap. And, and they would start to like change as you, and it would indicate like, okay, during the, and so like you're calling it away and you're sounding the alarm, you're doing all the things during the drill. And then you have to like let the, um, accumulators go down so that like header pressure then indicates like which side it's from so that you know what actions to take is pretty cool. But outside of stuff like that, I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I more and more just hate PowerPoint um, because it's yeah. like it's almost like it it triggers something in your brain that, oh, it's time to zone out and start thinking about all the things I need to do after this or, or whatever. Start thinking about my um, honey to do list when I get home. <laughs> yeah, that, that also yeah, gets um, into I mean, you're talking about death by PowerPoint and zoning out like if that's the whole way you run your training program. Um, the, the officer that was in charge of doing the qualifying interviews of my second command was notorious for getting an interview, but I mean, you've, you've done all this mindless training and like checkouts and stuff. And then you finally go up to him and ask for an interview. And this is also a secondary point of like, you know, if, if you're in a position to give interviews, how you should not treat people, but he (laughs) would just avoid the interview he'd make up a reason yeah. he'd one time he told me yeah. he had something to do in three hours which was just a little ridiculous but <laughs> once you finally get to the interview for him um like i said it was my second command i was coming off of a 9g boat we spent 45 minutes talking about life as an ever on 9g and like how <laughs> things go and you know like basically Uli's about the electric plant and then after that talk about a totally different platform, he was just like, okay, well, uh, you've stood a similar watch on that plant. So here's the things that are different and like signed it off. So wow. that just, you're already zoning out during the trainings and stuff. And then you go to an interview like that yeah. and you're just like, well, what was the point? Like, right. What was the point of even doing this? Yeah. Which I think we also Dude, touched I, yeah. on, on the first episode about checkout quality and yeah and yeah i think the reactor is critical when he did his episode also talked about that but you get one guy that's just gonna say you'll learn about it when you start saying the watch and then another guy's gonna ask you every nitpicky thing about the system yep. <laughs> so you don't know what to expect but yeah there is a yeah, happy medium I, the the interview stuff especially like where people are held up in quals because of the interview it like that always drove me nuts because like i i found myself talking to like there were just nukes that i would talk to or like a gangers or whoever that were like oh the eng won't give me an interview the eng won't give me an interview and so then i got i'm like the guy that's like okay fine to go stand outside the engine state room and i go into the engine state room i'm like hey sir what's up what's up with this you not giving interviews and he's like huh and then it's like you know right? like every every officer is is programmed somewhere like deep down in their in their dna like to fear chiefs in a certain in a certain way because they were raised by them and in the same way many people are where it's like a lot of time and especially if they're an academy grad like they have these things called company chiefs so it's kind of like their rdcs and so it's like if you come in there in that way they just like they go back instinctually and react in a certain kind of way so it's like and then you know edmc is obviously really good at that too but it's like just go in there and like metaphorically punch them in the face and just be like hey what are you doing like go do an interview and you just kind of can guilt them into doing it that way. So if there's a chief that you can leverage in that, because I, I did it to the end all the time. And I'm the cook chief. So it's like, I'm the last person that should probably be doing that. But it's still effective. Like the end was still afraid of me. So it's like, and part of that is my personality and the way I go about interacting with people. Um, but yeah, it. Well, that's probably it, like the detailing thing that, too, where you get somebody yeah. outside of your rate calling in. Like they're, you're, you're sure. the last person they expect. <laughs> Right. Right. And it's I'm going to do it a little differently each time. But like, yeah, it's it's part of it was because I was kind of like I filled in for the cob all the time. So it's like the cob coming and yelling at the end, like the end is going to react that like an authority figures talking to him. Um, but still, like it's it shouldn't have to happen, but it's it's a way of kind of getting around it is if you have uh, somebody available that can do that kind of thing, because like, yeah, same thing, man, I it. it it's got to happen everywhere because I've seen it, you've seen it, and I've heard a lot about it. It's it's one of those I, I don't understand why it's ever a thing. And then you guys, you got guys that are delinquent because they're waiting on that interview, so they're like being denied free time, like you talked about earlier, where it's like we already have such precious little free time 
that they're going to effectively get denied sleep because they're delinquent and have no control over it. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. hopefully the command is running, uh, you know, dink study, delinquent study in an effective way. Yeah. But right. that's actually one of the other points I had uh, written down in my little, my little notes here. But on my uh, first command, our ADMC decided that he wanted to do a double dink study, basically. So uh, you could be dink and quals overall, and you would have two hours of mm-hmm. dink study. And then for the nukes, if you failed, I think it was more like than a, two. So if you failed three or more CTEs in a row, okay, yeah, you would get put on CTE dink study, which for anybody that doesn't know, CTEs is like the monthly exam that nukes take. But yeah, um, so if you fail, it might have been it actually it might have been two in a row. I don't either way, but double dink study is not effective at all yeah. i think most people would argue that dink study in itself is usually not effective yeah. in the way we run it but so once yeah. we started the double dink study um i actually like part of me felt like this there's no way this can be allowed because you would do yeah uh the nuke cte dink study from 0 5 30 to 0 7 30 or it starts at 7 30 and then the qual dink study from 1800 to 2000 so if you were just not performing up to par you would be at work from 0 5 30 to 20 monday through friday and so That's... i actually went and looked it up um like what defines dink study and if there's any limitations for it and the best thing i could find was the extra military instruction uh definition from the jag manual and mm. somewhere in there it says that it shouldn't be for more than two hours a day or like normally shouldn't be. And then if, um, if the workday allows, it should be started at the end of the normal workday or, you know, at some reasonable time, basically, unless there's extenuating circumstances. So I, yeah. I printed off that little, uh, snippet from the JAG manual and I brought it up to my ADMC and said, you know, I, I get what you're trying to do, but, one, it's not working at all, clearly. And yeah. two, there's this thing that says, you know, normally should not be more than two hours per day if you're considering yeah. this EMI. And I guess you could make an argument that this is not a normal circumstance, but it's still like you're you're just beating your guys down. Yeah. And basically show him that instruction or snippet, whatever you want to call it. And he, he looked at it and read it and basically said like, Oh, cool. Like, thanks for showing me that. And it kept going. Yeah. It only went for a couple months because yep. I think he probably got talked to after enough people complained. Yeah. But. Well, ironically, and I think it's the SORM, but I'd have to, uh, same thing. I'd have to go hunting through some instructions. But I know for a fact, like, you, you can't work people past 1800 without the CO's permission. So it's like yeah. if, if the CO signed off on it, okay, I guess. I don't see how you could, you could, justify that to anyone but it's just like yeah and then as far as it being emi like really and it's when that's like i said that's the only thing i could find that would define yeah what dink study is because there's no military instruction of dink study it's just a a known thing which also might be a problem that we need to look into is actually defining dink study and what it should be so it's actually getting something done yeah i I do think a lot more things should be defined as as like there should be boundaries for them and it should be they should be a lot more clear. But as far as far stuff like that, it's like I'm going to be that guy again, dude, I need a button of like a stupid sound or something. But it's like <laughs> leadership development education would teach people that that's something like that's not valuable. Like you can't force compliance on stuff like this. Um very very rarely can you ever force compliance productively the only times that i would say you could is like if and it would be understood as positive by both the leader and the the person you know who you're forcing the compliance of is like when something's dangerous like or when when i i just can't afford to explain to you why you have to do this right now oh my god you know and i'm like yelling at you and i i will explain it later if i'm doing my job correctly 
when it's safe to do so or when I have the time to do so. Sometimes there's like a sense of urgency dictated by outside circumstances. And a lot of times the stuff where I would say that it's appropriate is safety related, like a casualty or like you're just doing something dangerous and you, that you're not recognizing it, we're recognizing it, but I do. And so I, I direct you in that way, like stop doing that right now. But you, when you talk about like forcing compliance for good order and discipline related things, blah, blah, blah. Like I, I use, I've used the hands in your pockets analogy for most of the time I've done this podcast and I used to be the guy that was like hard up on like get your hands out of your pockets because uniform regs say so but then i look at it more now as like it, it's we've created an un, unenforceable standard because people naturally want to put their hands in their pockets for a lot of different reasons and it's something that you you can't like point at a negative thing other than what it says in the uniform regs which is like it presents an unprofessional appearance and uh you can't enforce it because it's like if, if for any chief that t- tells any sailor to get their hands out of their pockets it, if they do it because like i tell chiefs and stuff all the time jokingly like i give them a hard time because my cmc does it i think he's like one of the best leaders i've ever met in my life um but you tell them and then the second you walk away they're going to go back to doing what they were doing because it's not hurting anyone and they know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's no real reason that they can't do it. Um, so it's like it's we've created an unenforceable standard and, and we try to force compliance there. And all we do is lose leadership capital. Like you just become the guy that junior sailors don't trust. And it's weird because you're like you're thinking about it like, well, that, you're not supposed to do that. And I'm the guy that's supposed to correct you for doing something you're not supposed to do. So when I do it then you create this weirdness where it's like now they don't trust me like what do you mean you i'm i'm telling you i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing and it's like you just lose leadership capital that way but then so you got the force compliance piece and then you get like where i need to i need to use like productive methods to get people to do a thing yeah and it's people think that that's productive that they can just force compliance because of their their rank and station in life and it it never works but then the story i tell all the time that kind of illustrates the point is i there was a cob that i I went on a boat and did an inspection this would have been probably a year and a half ago um and on the plan of the day because i always go look at the plan of the day just kind of see what they're doing and then um i look at something like the watch bill and to see where people are assigned and some other stuff because i eventually have to like make sure they're qualified and all that crap but um it said instead of like where it would have said delinquent and personnel or whatever and like hot runners it said shipmates that need our help and they had names and then uh, for the like watch station that they needed help with and then they would do like these qual things where senior people would show up and junior people would show up and the senior people would help the junior people and it was just made okay like it was create the culture was was like formed in a way where um that's what that was the expectation by the chain of command was that like look it's not it's not solely the brand new unqualified guy's responsibility to get that guy qualified. It's the responsibility of the senior qualified people to help that person through the process. And when they get behind because of difficulty with, you know, uh, retention or understanding or whatever it is, we're going to help them. Even if it's a lack of effort, like, okay, well, why you, you get into like the leadership principles. It's like, why is there a lack of effort? Why are they not put, you know what I mean? And like, what do I got to teach them? Because maybe I don't need to teach them about the hydraulic plant. Maybe I need to teach them about like why we're, why hard work is important and the rewards of it. Um, or why just it, having I, fish it, in general is, yeah, you know, a good thing. It's not just like some, right. oh, I got my fish and you don't. Like it, it right. does mean something. As who ya is that right. sounds and people, you know, want to say whatever. Like I'm honestly super proud of having my fish and you don't hear that from nukes a lot. I yeah. know, but. Yeah. And it's, it's the, the culture that was created there is possible because like when I was on my second submarine on my first chief's tour, the special boat, um, it, that culture was created by that cob there. And ironically, (laughs) both of those cobs, so the cob on that boat and the cob on the boat I just described, which was not a boat I was assigned to. I was just out there on a ride. 
both of them won the Frank Lister Award, which is like the best cop in the Navy Award. And it's just like, hmm, like maybe we're on to something here. And it's yeah. because the crew responded appropriately and they performed at a high level, not just in qualifications, but like major ships inspections, retention, all of the metrics by which a cob and the, the triad are measured all went like went up. Everybody was doing really well. They were happy to be there. They loved being a part of the organization and they performed accordingly. And it happened over a long period of time to where retention skyrocketed, you know, inspection grades skyrocketed. Um, uh, misconduct went way down. You know what I mean? Like we, we didn't have a lot of captain's masks on that boat. We didn't have a lot of DRBs on that boat. Like it happened, obviously like junior sailors are going to junior sailor. Like people still partied yeah. and got DUIs occasionally, but like it went way down. And so, you know, you just, and, and a lot of the ones that like you didn't see happen is like DRBs for like work controls issues. Cause people were doing a good job and like had the attention to detail and engagement and they were getting rest and they were happy. Like that was the the second boat I was on was the cob that was he had a hard and fast rule in the shipyard that if you were day after duty, you were off the submarine by thirteen hundred. And it was just like like you couldn't introduce new work after fifteen hundred ever. Like if the shipyard came down after fifteen hundred with new work, the duty officer told him to leave. And it was like he would he would go up to the whatever the um, I forget the name of the meeting, but like the daily planning meeting like it not the night work meeting on the boat but like the one they do at the shipyard um, yeah he would go up there and like flip out on them he's like we said at the beginning of this this uh availability that this is not a thing you will not bring down new work. like because all the only reason that was happening is the shipyard's inability to plan and then at the meetings they would say that they wouldn't do it and then they would do it anyway because you know shipyard so um yeah it was just they everybody was happy and and like healthy er, you know, like were they still working really hard? Were they still stressed out? Were they still all the things that we talk about? Yeah. It just wasn't untenable, you know? And, and that, yeah. that l- little bit, you know what I mean? Like him being able to, that cob being able to recover and give back to them that little bit of quality of life. That was enough. You know what I mean? Like they didn't demand more. They weren't like, it was, they understood what they were doing, especially on that boat. Like they understood what they were doing was important and they needed to work really hard and blah, blah, blah. But especially in the shipyard, like, do I really need to be here like super late? Do I, do I really need to get a 1500 work list? Do I really need to like, we're like calling people in because the shipyard brought a job down that after 1500 that we didn't know about, like, come on, like that shouldn't happen ever. So yeah, I think that you can gain so much by just doing it the right way, just doing it positively, you know, like introducing practices like that for when you like in relation to dink study where you're you're productively addressing the issue instead of just like punishing people because that's what dink study really is it's like it's a punishment for not meeting us an expectation that i think you could probably describe as largely unrealistic because i don't think i've ever met a nuke that hasn't been dink at some yeah no i mean it's it's super rare and yeah and you actually you just sparked up two uh points in my head so about when i'm talking about double dink study and then you kind of countered that with shipmates that need our help um i had to do some quick googling on my phone here because i I knew there was like a a name for it but um i'm also reading this off of wikipedia so my high school english teacher would probably kill me but (laughs) there's a there's a idea in psychology or whatever you want to call it, called the Rosenthal mm. effect, um, yeah. which is basically the idea of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So there was a study done a while ago, which a lot of people say isn't valid anymore because there's been a lot of counter studies to it. But we learned about it um, back in you know high school psychology class. So mm. I'm basically an expert by that means. But Obviously. Yeah. So um, it's off of Wikipedia here. It says that... Uh, Rosenthal and Jacobson held that high expectations lead to better performance and low expectations lead to worse, both effects leading to a self-fulfilling prophecy. So mm. on my side of it, you have the double dink study. And I mean, just the way, you know, again, being a nuke from my experience in this community, like 
And I think I brought it up at the end of the last episode, no matter how well you do, you're always going to get told like it could have been better. You could have yeah, done this more efficient. Yeah. If you're always needling people with those little points, which like, sure, they could yeah. be made in some way if they really need to be. But like, if you're always getting told this little thing could have been better, eventually you're going to just stop caring. You're eventually yeah. going to get to the point, which a lot of people do, especially in the new community of, yeah, I could try to, you know, be hotshot Joe Navy on this monitored maintenance item, but like they're still going to hit me on. I used a two and a half gallon bucket instead of a three gallon bucket, like something just meaningless yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Just like that. It might- just doesn't get yeah. anywhere like there's no point to it so if you have somebody that's yeah already obviously struggling with the expectations you have for quals or exam performance yes there should be some sort of corrective action and this is coming from somebody who struggles in quals like i know i'm bad at qualifying it's just something i live with but the way we handle it is not you know productive but if somebody is like right. struggling you don't need to tell them like all right we're well, going to be here till 20 hundred every night yeah like Okay, well, For you sure. know I'm going to yeah. sit here from 18 to 20, just like hanging out with the on watch, shut down reactor operator, if he's need of her, especially, or like, I'll just be like hanging out up forward with some of my Coner buddies, like, and yeah, maybe I'll get to check out, maybe I'll study, but like, yeah, I'm already unhappy at work, oh, and yeah. you're telling me I have to be here until 20 hundred, like, I'm, I'm not going to make anything of that, I'll qualify eventually, like, yeah. It's just, it's yeah. honestly the way it goes. And everybody knows that. And everybody sure. knows think study is a punishment, but nobody wants right. to actually like talk about it or make it effective. I, and I think just by virtue of it being negative reinforcement, like it, like what you said, it's like it, everybody knows that it's negative. So eventually that's going to dictate the response to it. Like, yeah, I'm going to respond negatively because you have negative expectations of me. Like the fact that, that that command thought double dink study was necessary communicates to people that you have low expectations of us. Yeah. That, like, Oh, well we can't qualify. So we have to do this, all this extra dink study time. Whereas when you're looking at like the shipmates that need our help concept that I'm, I'm going to organize an entire like hour or two of the day where I'm going to prioritize senior qualified people's attention in a way that actually helps you fix the problem of you don't understand or um, like just the retention part. Like maybe they, instead of staring at an SSM, like we're all, all told to, or like uh, staring at qual notes they got from a buddy, they need MMA two to take them on a field trip. And that's what they need yeah. is to like put their hands on it and and do the, the th- things that they need to do to retain the things. And that's by doing that, you're showing not just that we care about you and we really want you to qualify, but that you're willing to like expend resources to fix whatever that problem is that they're having. And that's going to bleed into everything else that they do where it's like any time that they're doing anything, they're going to trust that like their leadership actually cares about them and that if they need help with detailing or they need help with personal issues or they need help with whatever, that the command's actually there to help them out. And the the fun part about that command that I was talking about is like they actually were like you. I, I remember describing it like when we came down the hatch at the the personnel transfer for that inspection, it's like, my feet hit the deck plate coming down the let and it the energy felt different you know what i mean because you you come down and they've got like the bathtub set up and there's like people standing around you to like check you on the access list and tell you where to go and you know whatever and there's just all like the, it's like the small boat handling party people are all kind of standing around they take your flow co from you and you, you head on your way and it's like it was just different from the second we stepped on board where you could just tell like people, the look on people's face was different. The way they greeted you was different. Like it just, everything was different and it was like in a really, really great way. And so it's like it, that stuff, it's not just, you're not just fixing one thing. You know what I mean? Like it, it yeah. bleeds over into everything and becomes so it's cultural. Like, uh, it's like, have you ever seen the, the movie? I think it was idiocracy. The guy doing yeah. the reader thing at Costco. <laughs> and he's just welcome to Costco. Yeah. Like, if you go yeah. down to a boat, because I've gone to other boats to like get parts or ask for help for stuff with mm-hmm. EDIV and like 
Yeah. I mean, my first boat was pretty gross, but you can go down to other boats and you ask, you know, <laughs> for the tops I watch, like, where's your Edith hang out? And he not excitedly, but he's just like, oh man, they're like right down here. You just go down this ladder and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. Or you get a, I get a tops yeah. I watch where like, Hey, where are your, where does your Edith or like nukes hang out? Like, I don't know, man. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> Nor do I care. Yeah. yeah. And then when you're, yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's when you're making the point of like, doing the field trips and stuff uh, for like higher quality of qualifying and everything. I remember at one point I kind of told myself I was going to start doing better checkouts once I got to the point where I could like sign qual cards. But yeah, if, if junior kids came up to me asking to talk about a fire and a switchboard for shutdown electrical operator, like, you know, just discussing your actions for it. I started just actually running kids through it. Like, like if they were in it, which I noticed became a way yeah. more productive checkout because you'd ask people like, okay, this pump caught on fire. What do you do? And you just kind of stare at it. Right. And then, um, you would usually, you know, new guys don't really know where everything's powered from. So they'd be like, oh, I'd go to this switchboard. And so you just walk with them and you're like, okay, show me where the breaker is. And then they can't find the breaker on that switchboard. And you're like, yeah, because it's not powered right. from here. And while you were over here wasting yeah. your time, the fire spread and you just kind of compound right. it and you make them realize like how quickly things can get out of control. And then afterwards yep. explain it to them rather than just yeah. some guy coming up to you and Hey, we want to talk about a, a fire and you know, the, the lead hydraulic pump. And you're just like, all right, man, well, you're going to use, you know, whatever extinguishing agent and call it away on the forum C and you sign it off and mm -hmm. move on. Like, yeah. Yeah. They're not going to remember that in the same way they will. What, yeah. like the field, like the field trip and then the having to, like the understanding of what happens if they're wrong. Yeah. Like that's, I like that a lot about like the, um, the dive and drive trainer when, when we would do, um, stuff as chief of the watch or dive like i'd be in there and it's like you get to play around with things and it's okay if you mud dart the submarine even though that's not the goal because you get to see what happens like you get to really feel a jam dive casualty instead of just because like at sea i mean we might simulate it with an angle but that's about all you can do on in the trainer i mean that thing does everything <laughs> like it's it's yeah. really cool and you get to see the indications and if you do it if you don't respond wrong or, or like if you respond wrong or you don't do it fast enough, like you don't get your immediate actions done quickly enough, like it makes it worse. And <laughs> it's like you get to feel what worse is. And it's really it really illustrates the importance of the immediate actions, doing them in the correct order, uh, recognizing the indications of the casualty and blah, 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 like all the things you need to do it like reading it in a book and and talking through it at you know dow cow training or um or like even doing a drill underway it's like there's only so much you can simulate in a lot of those things where it's like i, I would say it's probably similar for people when they go to like the flooding trainer or the fire trainer and actually see fire or actually yeah. see like water spraying out of a flange you're just like it's different and like it's really valuable because you get to safely um, participate in what it would feel like in real life because I've been in some submarine fires that you know, it all worked out fine, obviously, but um, the, it's a different level of of I don't know, like stress and the way that you react is a little different. But it 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 is, but it isn't. It like it's and it's really illustrative of like what could go wrong and why it's so but important. You still, right, you still you get know. that adrenaline rush. Like for us going to yeah. the fighty where you sit in a fake maneuvering and it's all run by computers, but they have speakers that play the ambient, mm -hmm. you know, noise of the engine room, especially if like a, you know, some sort of steam rupture happens, it gets insanely loud in there. Like yep. you can't even hear yourself think or like yep. if we run a, a fire in the fighty, they'll actually cut off the air conditioning to that fake maneuvering. And I, oh, nice. I swear they got to put heaters on in there like it would be on the boat with all the machinery running, but it gets hot in there, like yeah. quite hot and stuffy. And you're trying to take comms like with your breathing protection on, like as much yeah. as nukes complain about going to the fighty, you get, you know, that, that rush and a little bit of hoo-yah out of Yeah. I thought that. Yeah. Fight. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's how the diving drive you get done. It's almost like you get it, by the end. You're like fried because they run yeah. you through so much crap and you get little breaks um, in, in the middle. Like they'll do little head breaks and stuff. But yeah, you're over there for like four hours and they like uh, sometimes longer depending on what we're doing. But like, yeah, it's like you, you get by the end. It's like you just get your brain is just mush. Because of the sensory overload, like, because the thing is moving, it's not like a platform on hydraulics. And so you feel the angles, you feel the rolls, you feel the, like everything. It's, it's really cool. And the same thing, they have like the simulated sounds and you're, you're sitting at a BCP and an SCP and you have people sitting sticks. It looks just like control on the boat. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's really valuable training in that way where you get to get to simulate the feelings and you for sure yeah your heart rate gets up man <laughs> like, yeah. I, I for all the times where i'm like walking over there just like oh, i gotta go to the trainer this is so stupid and then <laughs> but yeah you get in there and it's like when stuff starts popping off you get you, you get your heart rate up the only time i don't is when i have a ui and it's like because it's kind of not my problem it's like yeah. i'm just coaching <laughs> you know like so i get to detach myself and just kind of like laugh at the dude that's flopping and twitching but yeah, and that's usually uh, when you feel like the the total expert too. When you're in the trainer with the yeah, UI, obviously you're watching this kid you mess everything up. And you're just like, dude, how did you not think you, about this? Right, <laughs> you recognize everything immediately. Yeah. Like you start seeing the indications, <laughs> like like two body interaction. We're getting run over, dude. Like say something. But like when you're sitting there, you're the guy that doesn't see it because you're like looking around for everything. Did I do my logs this hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um. So then I'm, I'm going to kind of throw it throw it back probably 10 or 15 minutes at this point the the second it's point you were reminding me of was the whole 1500 release and shipyard thing yeah uh, i went through the same thing on my first boat when we went through an availability where the co put out if you're off going duty you shouldn't be here past 14 or 1500 can't remember what time it was yeah. but um and this is also going to lead into a lot of points i have about my first chief on my first boat oh, yeah. who was i was wondering when we were getting to that like, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's coming around but uh he yeah. was a solid dude he just wasn't a great chief which is kind of weird because yeah. he came to our boat at his 16 year point and retired mm -hmm. after his tour and like had been a chief for a while but i i don't know that could be like a, a whole nother thing maybe we'll get into that but there was one day where i was off going and it was coming up on 14 or 1500 I went looking for my chief to tell him I was going to be heading out. And he was in that, um, I think it was called the interface meeting where you go meet with the shipyard. The one you were yeah. trying to remember the name of I, that sounds right. It might not be, I don't know, but yeah. he was at whatever meeting and then I couldn't find him. So I told her LPO, but basically in my head, I was like, well, the, the captain said, you know, after this time and I'm off going off going mid watch on top of that, like I'm, I'm not going to be here. And, uh, so I left work and I uh, ended up going and helping uh, my wife out with something that was almost an hour away from my apartment. Um, so I drove probably 20 minutes from work to my apartment and went like an hour mm -hmm. past there to go help her with something. And then I get a call from one of the, the other electricians from one of the work numbers. So you see the work number pop up in your phone. And you're just like, Oh, great. <laughs> like, so I pick up the yeah. phone. He was like, Hey, chief, super mad that you're not here. Where are you? And I told him I was in whatever town. And he said, well, you need to come back to work. Like right now, he wants you back in 30 minutes. And I told him that was going to be physically impossible because of where I was. He was like, all right, well, I'll go talk yeah. to him. Um, it was one of the like more senior guys. So he said he was going to go talk to chief and see if he could like calm them down basically. But yeah, get a call back a little bit later. He's like, he wants you in here as soon as you can. And I was like, okay, why? Well, he's holding everybody else here uh, in injury middle level until you show back up because you didn't have permission <laughs> to leave. And so at this point, I'm like super mad about it, you know, being my spiteful junior self and basically told him like, well, you go tell chief, this is what the captain said. If chief wants to talk to me, he can call me himself. And I had like hung up and, I thought wow. that was going to get me somewhere, but get another call back, yeah. like not even five minutes later. I was like, chief's like dropping the mast word. Like he's, yeah. he's going to be writing you up for this. I was like, all right, fine. I'll be there in like maybe an hour and a half if I speed. So I get back to the boat and it's like 18, 1900 by the time I get back. 
and yeah. uh everybody's an injured middle level and they're all like they're all sitting down there like oh thanks dude we're all here because of you like, all right well where's chief yeah at? You know, he's down he in Chiefs' home. quarters waiting for you. Oh, so. I thought he, no, yeah, I thought he didn't he go home. He went home. It's <laughs> like this mother. But uh, so I got on Chiefs' quarters and talked to him, and he basically asked, like, why did you think you were allowed to leave? And I told him the captain put out literally a week or two ago, the new policy is if you're here off going, you don't stay past this time. And then he came back at me with, I don't care what the captain said. A little more colorful. <laughs> That's a mistake. But, yeah. yeah. And so I was just like, but, okay, but. That's like from the captain, like the dude in charge of everybody <laughs> yeah. here. He's like, well, I don't care yeah. what the captain says. We had work to do, and you didn't tell me you were leaving. And I told me it was in a meeting, but you know, obviously he didn't care about that. But that was just like a yeah. whole big thing. And then, uh, you know, for for the rest of the time, we were in that lull period in shipyard. Ediv did not get to go home off going until our chief specifically said so. And he was the, the type of dude that would have people there for, you know, just in case pretty yeah. much every day but yeah i actually have yeah, that... like five points i think about that guy just bad experience with him which like i said i i hate to do because we had eat of cookouts like barbecues at his house while we're in shipyard and yeah him and his wife were super cool you know you let us hang out there if you drank too much yeah. you let you crash on his couch like just super awesome guy but yeah it, when it comes dude, to like it's not, work, and it's not, it was just yeah it's not it doesn't like it doesn't mean he's a bad guy like you were saying like it's not like his leadership deficiencies are it's just like a thing he could do better at work it doesn't mean he's a bad dude like i talk about the chief i had on my second boat because i showed up as a first class and then like i think it's eight or nine months in or something i made chief and then they kept me there um, but that dude was useless as a chief. Like he was terrible. Like he did, he never progressed past being a second class. Um, but he was a great person. Like he was a really great guy. Um, he just should have never been in a leadership position. He was a guy that he was, he should have been in the galley cooking food and he would have made the crew real happy doing it. But like, he's just a dude that promoted for whatever reason, and shouldn't shouldn't have like because a lot of times like you'll see i mean it doesn't happen as often nowadays but back in the day like cooks would get like uh meritorious advance for cooking good and it's like <laughs> this dude cooked really good but it's like that doesn't mean he should be an lpo that doesn't mean yeah. he should be an lcpo like he was not equipped to handle that role in any way shape or form great person though like i i still love the dude if i saw him i'd give him a big bear hug he's a, he's a great guy um, and I think that it's hard for people to separate those two things. And even the way that you're saying it, it's like, you're not, it's not a personal attack on him to say that he did things poorly as a leader. And that's, what's so unfortunate about the way we handle a lot of this stuff is it's like, we were, we did this, um, activity the other night at our final night thing for the chiefs. And it's like, it's an, it was an illustration of, um, a leader's need to be able to accept criticism and it's like a thing that it's a thing we say that we do in the chief's mess that we don't always do like i'd say more often than not we're probably bad at it but we talk about it like hey we're this is a thing that we need to be able to do so i mean at least it's talked about i guess but yeah and sometimes sometimes i've been in messes where it's really productive and we're willing to like call everybody out and it's done in a productive way like but um I'm a big fan of when people tell me I'm doing something wrong. And, and be, like we talked about even before we started recording, like the criticism the last episode got and like what we could do better um, during this one. And I, I hope we're doing it, but it's uh, it's something that a lot of people have a hard time with. They take it as like a personal attack on who they are instead of just like a critique of the way they're doing a thing. And it's like the for this, I, I don't think it's bad at all to talk about those things and, and like get you have to to get better at it. Yeah. Even if it's just you recognizing the lessons in it because he's now retired. It's like it's it's something that if we did if we did this a lot more proactively and it was built into like our institution's understanding of how all leadership should do their job, like we would be immeasurably better for it. Yeah. I mean that's why I made the point of like he was a, a good guy. Yeah. You know, like I said, we would do barbecues at his house and just go right. chill for the night. 
and like right not really worry about anything but then at work like like i said about that thing about holding everybody until i came back when yeah I guess you could pin some blame on me because I mean I I told her LPO but I probably should have stuck around for chief but at the same time like when I, I come back and he says I don't care what the captain said like yeah that kind of struck think, me a little wrong I if you hadn't talked to the LPO either and just said well the captain said so I'm bouncing without checking out with anybody I'd be mad and it wouldn't be because I was going to flagrantly disregard what my CO said it's because I need to know where my people are I need to know if you're leaving, I need to know you're leaving. I'm not saying I would prevent you from leaving, but I need to know that you're leaving the submarine because what if? Because what if I had something going on and I, I in that meeting, I got the commanding officer's permission to work that day past 1500 because something came up that you didn't know about yet. So there's that kind of a thing, but it's like I, I used to always tell my people like either give me a, a notification, just like a, hey, chief, I'm taking off. Um, do you need anything? Or... If I told, I would explicitly tell my LPO, hey, you got liberty because I'm going to go do a meeting and I'm going to go do all this other stuff. So that then if you go to the, go to the LPO and be like, hey, can I get out of here? Oh, yeah, you're good, man. Get out of here. And it, so if my LPO knows, even if I forgot, which I would do quite often, I'd be like, where in the hell is this guy at? And my LPO would be like, oh, you t- told me I had liberty and I sent him home. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll talk to him tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like one of those two things you gotta balance it that way because I don't want to waste their time ever because their time is so valuable and you you lose a lot of, of leadership capital that way. Um but yeah, I mean if like you're if you're you hadn't talked to the LPO, I'd have a different feeling about it. But because you did, I don't think it was unreasonable at all for you to leave. Like your LPO told you it was cool. So that's I that's a chief should be yelling at the LPO if he's got a problem with it. And even then it's like they're the LPO like they're I feel like they're the people that should be managing Liberty the the majority of the time. And it's like the only time my LPO didn't own Liberty was when I it, it developed into like once I if I told him, hey, don't let anybody leave until I'm done with this meeting or, or whatever. It turned into that event like it started as I would explicitly tell him he had Liberty so that I wasn't on like preventing people from going home for no reason by not being available. But once I trusted his judgment the way that I did, which happened pretty quickly, it was just like a, yeah, the LPO owns Liberty. Don't, don't look at me. Cause I'm all over the place all the time. Um, unless yeah. I told him otherwise. Yeah. I think, I think it was totally reasonable for you to leave. Well, and, uh, I guess, I mean, now that we're on the topic of him and getting to the other stories I had from him, just again, just like the few worst experiences I can remember, but yeah. Uh, so one morning, um, we were up in shipyard in New Hampshire, which obviously gets pretty cold in the winter time. Yeah. So we had one of our other electricians go out in the morning and start his car up to start warming it up and went back in his apartment or house or whatever. They went back inside to like just let his car warm up for like five or 10 minutes and yeah. finished getting his boots on, getting his coffee, whatever he was doing. He walks back out into the parking lot and the whole hood of his car is on fire. Like Yikes. something just failed and yeah started a fire so um he you know got that taken care of um i guess like you know fire department whatever showed up and then he was starting the process with the insurance and Mm -hmm. then he called our uh our barge and i've been on duty the night before and i was hanging out in the edive space so i picked up the phone and he told me what was going on and i said like all right cool you know like take care of that i'll let chief know when he shows up for quarters and our chief showed up for quarters and I told him what was going on. And uh, me and this electrician were like really good friends outside of work too. Like we hung out all the yeah. time. So and our chief knew that. So he basically told me like, well, you guys hang out a lot. You know where he lives. Go pick him up. And I was like, chief, are you serious? Like his, his car caught on fire. He's like on the phone with insurance right now. He's got to figure this yeah. out. That's his ride to and from work. He doesn't have it anymore. So like at least, you know, let him figure that out for the day. But our chief was like, no, I don't care. He's got to be here. We got a lot going on. Like, okay. We, we can't have that much going on. We're in shipyard where we, you know, can't handle yeah. losing one guy. But right. so, um, yeah, I had to drive out to his place. I mean, we honestly, we took our time. We stopped at Dunkin' Donuts and got breakfast and took our time <laughs> eating our, uh, you know, sausage, egg and cheese biscuits or whatever. And like my it. truck in the parking like lot it. when we got back. But <laughs> it's it just the idea of like especially being in shipyard like this dude's car literally just 
burst into flames yeah. for no reason, but he, he's got to be here because we have, you know, yeah. a, a fan controller to blow the dust out of for five minutes. Right. Like, and I wonder um, how much, how much of that is just the, like we build this fear of um, like disapproval into these guys when they go through the chief season. And like, I wonder how much of that gets like embedded in the programming. You know what I mean? Like I, I cause I, I, it's not like, I don't have that. Like I've, I've had that fear of like the chain of command disapproving like the way in which I'm doing my job. And luckily, like I also have a lot of other processes running at the same time that prevent me from acting insane as a result. But it's like, you see people do things like that. And that seems irrational when on the surface, when, when a chief is demanding that you go pick a guy up when his car was on fire. Like if I was that kid, I wouldn't have, I would have been like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'll deal with the consequences when I'm done. (laughs) But like my car, like that would be one of those things where I'd be like, I'm willing to bet the house that if this goes to DRB, like it it won't even go to DRB. Like if, if he tries to push it that way, the cop's going to like tell him he's an idiot for trying to call me in. And it's like, I, at at worst, I get the cob's finger wagged at me and then move on with life. Like no way this goes to mast. And so it's like, dude, like the glorious bastards line of I've been chewed out before. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. By better men than you. And it's just like, get out of here with this. Like I would have gambled there, but like it, that's, that's irrational and like crazy. That's like crazy behavior where the only real explanation is that chief is so afraid of disapproval from the chain of command that he's like, like you said, demanding that everybody be present so they can work through a innocuous work list during shipyard in the most because and I, but to be fair to your chief too, like the type of like night work meetings I've sat at where the CO is just like face blasting people because like they can't brief their night work list or they can't they don't have a adequate plan in his opinion or crit path work especially like if it's not going at light speed like he wants it to or there's some kind of like hiccup because the shipyard sucks it's all our fault and we're horrible people and he throws his papers and storms out of the night work meeting that then takes four hours because we have to restart it so many times because he's a psycho that should be medicated like <laughs> It's you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. there's stuff like that that happens, man. And it's just like if you've never gone to one of those meetings, it's like it's heavy, especially for maintenance heavy divisions like EDIV, A gang, MDIV, like they get their souls crushed. And a lot of times layered on top of that is this weird expectation that a, a division officer that barely knows their way around the submarine competently briefs the work list while the chief or LPO is sitting right there cringing. And then they're idiots. And oh my God, we're like, if the table wasn't bolted down, I'd flip it over and storm out because I'm a child. And it's just like, you can't win, you know? And it's like, so he probably had a really healthy fear of that type of interaction if I had to. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm going off and speculating a bit here. I would agree with that because he, I mean, I've actually never thought about that side, but he also did complain about how he had never been able to make senior chief up until right when he retired. So maybe yeah. he was just trying to show good face, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe. I mean, in the same, actually in the same winter, uh, again, New Hampshire winter, it gets ungodly yeah. cold, but <laughs> yeah, the heat in my apartment went out. Um, one of my roommates was a pretty senior mechanic when we first got up there. And then a couple months later, he got out of the Navy and moved out and he was in charge of the heat bill. And didn't tell us that was not included with the utilities bill. So yeah. he moved out like late summer, early fall and stopped paying the heat bill. So they shut it off like right before the winter, which if he had moved out like a month later, it wouldn't have gotten shut off because the northern states have whatever law about. And it might be a countrywide, but I know especially the northern states have a law about you're not allowed to shut off heat because somebody stops paying in the winter time because right. that's literally going to kill them. But yeah. So when the cold first started hitting, we noticed our, our heat wasn't really keeping up and we we're like, well, you know, maybe it's just like an old unit. Like maybe you can't really keep up with yeah. the cold and that's fine. And then our apartment started dipping down to like mid fifties and we were like, okay, this is a problem. So we, 
Yeah. We called the apartment, you know, office or whatever, and they told us we hadn't been paying our bill. And then that was a whole thing about why didn't you tell us, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I went to work and, uh, told my chief like, Hey, our, turns out our heat hasn't been working in the apartment and it's dipping down pretty low. And at the time, uh, my wife and I were, uh, dating and we had just gotten a, a little German shepherd puppy. Yeah. So I'm telling my chief, like, you know, my girlfriend just moved in and we got this little puppy in the house. Like all of us kind of need heat. And then like the other two roommates, like they're pretty miserable too. And then told him that, um, because it's winter time now and they're so backed up on appointments, they're going to be here next week between the hours of Tuesday, you know, whenever they can get there. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so basically asking for a day off from work again, while we're in shipyard and I'm pretty sure we're still in dry dock at this point. But, uh, he came back at me with, well, what does your girlfriend do? Yeah. I was like, well, I mean, she has a job also, but because she she should be at home barefoot and pregnant. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, Jesus so I was, Christ. I told him, like, she has a job, but, like, if she doesn't yeah. show up for the job, she doesn't get paid. If I take a day yeah. off of work, I still get paid. And, like, if they show up at nine in the morning, I'll call the barge and see if you still need me to come in. Like, I told him, like, if they show up first thing in the morning, I'll still come into work, but, like, I don't know when they're going to be there. Right. And he got, right. All, he got all upset about that and. Uh, told me I need to come in on on that Tuesday until lunch, and then I can go home. Which so you probably got, missed the. Yeah. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't miss it. I mean, I got like super uh, upset about it, but I stayed until like eleven on that Tuesday. Went home, and they ended up not showing up until almost five in the afternoon. But oh, okay. Uh, so I mean, that was good, but at the same time, it was just kind of like that instant response of, well, like, "What does yeah. your girlfriend do?" It's like, right, work. But I don't know. Like also. <laughs> Like, dude, I could tell you, like, during, like, periods of time where we were getting ready to get the boat to sea, it's like if one of my guys came up with something compelling, it's like, yeah, don't come in, dude. Like, that's fine. It's not, nothing is that pressing. And also, like, it's one of those things where if there's something going on that you need to, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just wired differently. Like, I've always devoted the bandwidth to, like... I need you to be focused on what's happening here. So something like that's going on at home, you're not going to be focused on what's going on here. So go fix it like right now. I want you focused on. And if I got to like pull strings, let me know, call me, tell me what's going on. It would be like, and I, I would expect because if I was a second class, even though I loved my chief, I would do the same thing. I would expect you to not be there at all. Even if they showed up at nine in the morning, like, take the day bro like it's fine (laughs) like the world's not gonna stop spinning and it's like if i gotta pick up some of your slack because of it whatever like because then not only do i have you focus but it's like you buy so much trust by by showing your people that you care in that way like i care if your wife is and dog and roommates have heat like i care about that so yeah, that's clearly more important than us blowing dust out of a fan or whatever. Like that's on that's on workless that day, and not just because like it, it's not relevant that we're in the shipyard. It's like if I can afford to lose you, okay, fine. Like go do what you got to do, man. Stuff like that's going to come up, and I kind of, I kind of uh, account for that in my like leadership calculus. Like when I'm planning how my people are going to be used and what's going. Like there's going to be times where I got to send a guy to dental to get unclass Ford so that they can go on deployment like because of course they didn't do it when the boat was underway or when we were had more bandwidth or whatever um you just got to kind of try to like i plan for as much as i can plan for and i push people to do all those things ahead of time and hey make sure you get your ids renewed and take care of all this kind of crap while we have the bandwidth to do it so that when it's time to get the ship underway we're focused on getting the ship underway but stuff's going to pop up no matter what no matter how well i plan yeah, it's life's like, going to punch you in the face sometimes. Yeah. And when it does, it's people look at it like a crisis and it's like you should be looking at it as a leadership opportunity. Like, yeah, maybe you're in a little more pain, like because that person's not there that day, especially if they're one of the more competent, useful people in the division. But also like I there's ways around that, including me picking up slack if I have to. And it is what it is. It's one day like <laughs> you're not losing the guy for a week. And so like. I mean, if something crazy was happening and I absolutely had to have that person, I may ask the question, is there any way your wife can do it? 
Because if not, like if not, like it is what it is and we'll figure it out. Or worst case scenario, like maybe somebody else is at your apartment. Like we figure out a way to, to so your roommate, like maybe your roommate's on shore duty and I can call his chief and be like, hey man, I really need somebody to be at the apartment for my guy that day, but I can't afford to lose him. Is there any way you could give him a day off? Like people don't think that way. And it's like, it was, that's it not also just a hard the, thing. It was just the tone that he said, well, yeah, what does your yeah. girlfriend do? Like, right. It wasn't a, is she going to be available that day? Or like my other two roommates were also on the same boat. Um, I think one of them was on duty, but I mean, he didn't even ask about them. It was literally just the first question. Like, what does your girlfriend do? Like she has a job. Like she doesn't get paid if she misses even, you know, a couple hours. That's a couple hours of pay that she misses. But right. Well, then the even easier answer would have been go talk to those other chiefs. Be like, hey, can you afford to lose? Like, if I if if it really was so critical that you be there, which it probably wasn't. Yeah, it's like you know, if if that were the case, but people just don't think about it that way. And so, like, yeah, he he's immediately thinking that what your girlfriend does is less important than you being on the boat to do arbitrary maintenance items, which is not the right answer at all. But yeah, it's it's gross that leaders don't spend more time thinking about the fact that their people need to be well taken care of so that they're ready and focused on what has to happen on the submarine. And, and, but then you bring in the variable of you were in the shipyard. So it's like, if you miss a day, who cares? Like there's uh, oh we got to do this one or two arbitrary maintenance items the next day. Wh- whoopee. Like who cares? And if you brief that to the chain of command, like, oh, well, EMN2 had an issue with this heat at home. So those items are going to be kicked to the next day. Nobody's even going to blink at that. Like I was down a person today due to like them having to deal with a heat, like a heater going out in the middle of winter, New Hampshire. Sounds like a great reason to not be at work to me. All right. Next, next, next division. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. When outside ambient temperature is negative 20 with a wind chill. Yeah. Reasons I don't ever want to live there, but yeah, whatever. Pretty, pretty, va- pretty valid reason to not be at work. Check out the rest of the episode in part two and don't give up the ship.